lost. <laughs> this feels good. This also feels a bit like the final scene in Jurassic Park. Remember when Dr. Grant, Ellie, Ian, John Hammond, and the kids fly away from the island having barely escaped with their lives? Then it cuts back to the T-Rex who lets out a giant I won this election by a lot. That's what this moment in American history feels like. We barely got away from Trump with our lives. But the problem is, there's still dinosaurs back there. Trump voters, far-right extremists, and Republicans. And Joe Biden is a bit like Dr. Hammond, who's like, we can work with them. They'll have an epiphany. I'm Francesca Fiorentini, and we're looking at the lessons of the 2020 election for Democrats, and how to ensure that Trumpism does not rear its head again. Because after all, fascism finds a way. Joe Biden won the presidency, and Trump will be out of office come January. That is, unless he refuses to leave, in which case the military will have the embarrassing task of removing him, the same way they'll have to remove all the Trump wigs from the nuclear warheads, which he might actually fire off in the next month, and perhaps even at his own people. Have I mentioned there are five Jurassic Park movies? No matter what the urchin does, in a couple of short months, the real work begins. And inheriting this America is not an easy task. There's a health crisis, an economic crisis, a climate crisis, a crisis in policing, and Beyonce's activewear line has sold out. And now, a debate is raging about how much Biden can get done, what those priorities are, and who he should be answering to. That debate has everything to do with the fact that Democrats lost House seats, may not win back the Senate, and didn't win by the percentages they thought they would. It's the kind of intra-party discord that can only be resolved by pushing Nate Silver and Nate Cohn out to sea. Sorry, Nate. It's for the good of the country. I'm sure you'll come up with odds for how long it'll take to find land which will be wrong. Of course, on mainstream outlets, the debate about what's next for Biden and the Democrats is ironically dominated by a lot of former and current Republicans. He will govern from the middle. He will make deals. People on the far left and far right won't like it. For all the Republicans that came out, the Lincoln Project, those people have to be part of his governing coalition. I don't think the American people want to sign up for the Green New Deal. I don't think they're interested in Medicare for all. We're not going to be turning on a sharp left turn in terms of public policy. Frankly, the Democrats have to make it clear to the far left that they almost cost him this election. Wow. Uh, okay, John, let's do this. First of all, between you and the career war criminals turned Biden supporters, you've got yourself a few dozen voters. And hey, look, that's enough moderates to swing jack sh Watching never-Trump Republicans convince themselves into thinking they know what all Americans want is a bit like listening to a sixth grade boy talking about what girls want. The thing about chicks is that they really like boys who are good at Minecraft, have asthma, and tell them how to wear their hair. If people are gonna BS about what Biden's mandate is, at least back it up with stats. Because as it turns out, there is no evidence that shows moderate Republicans swayed the election for Biden. In fact, quite the opposite. It was Trump who turned out Republicans, and in staggering and upsetting numbers. Earlier this summer, we asked if racism would bring voters to the polls. It did. 70 million of them. This brand of racist authoritarianism was so powerful, it even brought some people of color out, who I assume voted on their way back from dropping off their abuela at ICE. But the fear of Trump also turned out more voters for Biden. And it was young people, people of color, and specifically women of color who care about progressive issues that Kasich considers far left that made the difference. 62% of 18 to 29 year old voters voted for Biden, an estimated 10% increase specifically in battleground states. A near 90% of black voters came out for him, and in clincher states like Nevada and Arizona, the Latino vote overwhelmingly went to Biden and most likely made the difference. Mind you, that's in the face of disproportionate voter suppression of those same groups. Basically, young people and people of color were all Michael Jordan in the 1997 NBA Finals, racking up 38 points and a game winner while being sick with the flu. And somehow, Mitt Romney's trying to give the game ball to Luke Longley. You did nothing, Luke! 
Of course, the turnout didn't just materialize out of thin air. It was thanks to grassroots organizers who made it a priority to mobilize these communities that have been long taken for granted. As former Bernie Sanders campaign co-chair Nina Turner put it, it was not the political operatives at the Lincoln Project or the Third Way who knocked the doors, who spoke to the voters, who heard their concerns. It was laid off union members in South Phoenix, African American community organizers in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Latinx Zoomers in Reading, Pennsylvania. None of us in tend to let the far right of the Democratic coalition claim a mandate for status quo politics. Mm, girl, if you don't run for president one day, I swear to God. So let's look at all the radical politics of the people who came out for Biden, and of those House Democrats who did manage to win their seats back. Despite what guys like Kasich and Romney think, no House Democrat who strongly endorsed Medicare for All lost their seat. I repeat, no House Democrat who strongly endorsed Medicare for All lost their seat. And young people are making the connection between having health care and this pandemic we're still not out of. Because we are living within COVID-19 pandemic, as well as a racial pandemic, I really feel as if healthcare is a key piece to ensure that everybody is well and healthy and alive. <laughs> All I heard was, I want my avocado toast. <laughs> The issues that young Biden voters said they were concerned about were the coronavirus, racism, and climate change. And yet the solutions to those problems are somehow seen as radical by the same conservatives who think fusion food is radical. I do not know what a Korean taco is and I don't care to find out. One poll showed that openly talking about Biden's groundbreaking $2 trillion climate plan was explicitly mobilizing for those young voters. But obviously, they're typical Marxists wanting to redistribute all the life. What about Black Lives Matter and the calls to defund the police? Representative James Clyburn of South Carolina claims it alienates Democratic voters. And yet, while voter registration was at a worrisome low in the spring compared to the same period in 2016, it skyrocketed in the wake of the demonstrations over George Floyd's murder. The movement energy helped the electoral strategy. Voters are turning on status quo policies and candidates all over the country. It's why progressives like Cori Bush and Jamal Bowman and others keep successfully primarying moderate Democratic incumbents and why voters, no matter which party, are blazing forward with ballot measures that weren't necessarily backed by Democratic leadership. Colorado passed a 12-week paid family leave law, the first of its kind in the nation. Arizona voted for a tax increase on the wealthy to fund public education. And four more states approved recreational marijuana, including red strongholds like South Dakota and Montana. Those states won't be red for long, though. I mean, how many stoner fascists do you know? other than Elon Musk. In Florida, voters passed a $15 minimum wage, even though the state Democratic Party didn't endorse it, a reason one state representative believes her party lost seats in the state. The Democratic Party doesn't have values, that we run on an anti-Trump message and don't offer local solutions or ideas to inspire folks to actually come out and choose you to vote for you. Not endorsing a minimum wage measure, she said, was another example of why Democrats keep losing and revealed how beholden the party is to donors and consultants. Yeah, didn't we establish Democratic consultants are trash back in February after an app botched the Iowa caucus? See, where uh, the problem was is that we did not calculate the time it would take to remote download the update for, and my check is cleared, goodbye. And yet one of Joe Biden's cabinet picks for Commerce Secretary is Meg Whitman, the former head of the failed streaming app Quibi that lasted six months. What will her solution to the financial crisis be? Turn it sideways and give it a paywall? But truly, Quibi was an app that spent $2 billion trying to lure young people with celebrity content while never actually taking the time to ask what young people wanted. Quibi was basically if the Democratic Party were a streaming service. Biden is also considering former Senator Heidi Heidkamp, who was for the Keystone XL pipeline as Secretary of Agriculture, and a possible Secretary of Energy with ties to the fossil fuel industry. And of course, Joe Biden's transition team is reportedly vetting a handful of Republicans for potential cabinet positions, some of the names being floated. Former Ohio Governor John Kasich. Oh, John, I get it. It's a job interview. 
There are real forces pushing back on an ill-advised rightward shift of a Biden presidency. Groups who formed part of the Biden-Bernie coalition and who were pivotal in the Democratic victory are keeping the pressure on. And thank God, because the stakes could not be higher. Because it is precisely the shift away from working class concerns and toward corporate interests and precisely the capitulation to dangerous Republicans that helped fuel the rise of Donald Trump in the first place. A guy who rightfully said Washington was broken, but then said he would fix it, much in the same way that Hannibal Lecter said he'd take care of dinner. Republicans have proven time and time again they have no interest in working with Democrats. They don't even have an interest in recognizing the reality that Joe Biden is the president-elect. And we're supposed to meet them in the middle? What would that even look like at this point? Donald Trump is president and Joe Biden is his driver. It all goes back to that final scene in Jurassic Park. Dr. Alan Grant looks out the plane window and sees birds flying along the water, the origin of what became those terrifying and destructive dinosaurs. Those birds? Those are moderate Democrats. Their hollow backbones and middling policies seem harmless, but then you wake up 30 years later with massive inequality, the prison industrial complex, no health care, and a bronzosaurus just breached the perimeter. But because people's lives have gotten all the more horrible, they'll probably start to look at the velociraptors and think, gee, they seem to have the courage of their convictions. I mean, they're smart, look at them, opening doorknobs. And then we're all f***ed. This is the Democrats' last chance to make good on their promises, make actual change in Americans' lives, and save this country from a smarter fascist, which, let's be honest, isn't a high bar. As AOC says, progressives are the democratic base, and that base isn't the enemy. Authoritarianism is. It's time for Democrats to give up the moderate Republican ghost and embrace their base. The future of our democracy is still up for grabs. Hold on to your butts. Thank you for watching Newsbroke. That is our final piece of 2020, and thank God, because I'm tired as hell and I will not take it anymore. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thanks for your comments. Let us know what you're hoping a Joe Biden administration looks like and how it responds to the grassroots. And thank you to everyone who's made Newsbroke possible, to all the producers and the writers and the team at AJ+. Couldn't have done it without you, but especially you, the viewers.